Hello, and let's get started. Welcome. We're glad you could join us today for this webinar titled, When the Practice Pivoted, Restorative Justice in a Virtual World. This program is sponsored by the Initiative on Restorative Justice and Healing at the University of St. Thomas School of Law here in Minneapolis. My name is Julie Craven, and along with Father Dan Griffith, we direct the activities of this initiative. The definition that I feel does a terrific job of describing restorative justice comes from our colleague here at the law school, Professor Mark Osler. In his words, restorative justice allows for a broader and more human approach as it allows for change, restoration, and transformation. It tells the rest of the story before and after the event. It tells the story in time, space, and faith. Restorative justice has become a worldwide movement across various disciplines because it is effective. The purpose of our initiative is to teach law students and the broader legal community how to utilize restorative justice practices within our courts and communities to facilitate healing with three main focus areas that name and help heal the harm. Those three are racial justice, institutional leadership failures, and societal polarization. The initiative launched last year, and that step formalized work in restorative justice that our group has been doing since 2016. Our Dean at the law school, Rob Fisher, often mentions that we are a law school community, fully and painfully aware of our capacity to touch lives in a broken world. Our initiative programs most often talk about the what of this work, the harm and the healing. Today, we'll talk about the how of this process, specifically how those practices change these past two years, the result of the COVID pandemic. The two noted panelists joining us today have significant hands-on experience in the practice when it indeed pivoted. Ian Martyr is an assistant professor in criminology at Maynooth University School of Law and Criminology in County Kildare, Ireland. He became interested in restorative practices during his undergraduate years and has worked in the field ever since. His recent writing has described some of the ways restorative practitioners in Europe, the United States and Australia moved online, how the practice evolved and what the implications might be for future work. Many of you know David Karp at the University of San Diego. When I visited with him about this webinar, I said, who on your team really has got a kind of a handle for this work? He goes, you want Ashley. The University of San Diego Center for Restorative Justice promotes research, training, teaching, and implementation support for restorative justice. Ashley is their director of training. During the pandemic, she designed restorative practices for her colleagues and her own work at USD. Her experience has included restorative circle facilitation for community building and harm repair and a wide range of other learning opportunities. I will moderate the panel. I serve as associate director for the initiative. Prior to this work, my career included marketing and communications, most recently as vice president of communications for Hormel Foods Corporation. The discussion questions were included in the email with the link, so we'll get started. Please make note of any questions you may have in the Q&A. The chat will be open for dumb discussion as well, and we will shift to questions near the end of the hour. Okay, kicking it off. In the months before the pandemic began, Zoom had about 10 million daily meeting participants. By June of 2020, that number had risen to 300 million. People, even those who weren't all that tech savvy, climbed the learning curve and they climbed it fast. For Ian and Ashley, were there aha moments where you found a virtual option not only worked, but perhaps appeared to have advantages? And Ian, we'll start with you. Thanks very much for this, Julie. Just to preface uh, what I'm gonna say, uh, 
um, with where I get the information from. So we gathered information during monthly uh, meetings, which I facilitated and organized in collaboration with the Estonian Ministry of Justice. And those took place for four months at right at the start of the pandemic. Over the course of those four meetings, about 60 mostly restorative justice practitioners and service managers from 20 countries attended to discuss various issues, including preparing for and facilitating victim offender dialogue online, using restorative practices to support citizens and professionals during and following lockdowns, also readying restorative justice services to return to face-to-face -to -face work, and also the potential for restorative and transitional approaches to respond to trauma and grief. And the paper that we wrote on it was also based on Meredith Rossner's work, um, a prof at Australian National University, and she'd conducted some research also with restorative justice practitioners about moving online. And that was based on the fact that she'd done a lot of work on uh, virtual and hybrid court settings as well. So in relation to your question, I, I divide it into restorative justice and restorative practice. So for restorative justice, the potential advantages were for those who maybe did not want face-to-face -face dialogue, but who could um, benefit more from some sort of direct communication than had they only communicated indirectly. So I'm thinking, for example, of participants who were uh, highly affected by high impact offenses, some of whom felt um, protected because of the distance that the screen enabled. Probably they wouldn't have been able to meet face to face. They might have gone for a letter writing or a shuttle mediation, but they were able to meet face to face uh, because mm -hmm. uh, restorative justice for, uh, services participated in Zoom. Also, there are people who could not do face-to-face -face due to distance, and there were a number of restorative justice services which spoke about, you know, enabling international restorative justice conferences, or indeed that it could be easier to include more support people that might be what, you know, we'd roughly call the community of care, family members and so on, or perhaps certain professionals that were relevant um, who would not have been able to make face-to-face -face preparation and dialogue meetings, but could make it because, you know, they can turn it on at one minute to the hour and turn it off immediately after. There's no commuting time effectively. Then in terms of restorative practices, I suppose, um, you know, I use circles in workshops and with students and in research and in most of the work that I do. And what I find interesting about Zoom is it's very conducive to a circle because everyone can see each other and you absolutely have to only talk one at a time, otherwise it doesn't work. Also, everyone can contribute simultaneously in the chat or maybe there are people who would pass if it were in person, but who are happy to put something in the chat but don't wanna speak verbally. Um, for relationship building, I thought it was fantastic because it permitted um, check-in questions like, get something from your house that tells a story about you. I absolutely love doing that. And likewise, it enabled kind of innovative practices that were a bit more restorative justice but were just easier because people could participate from home. So we spoke to restorative justice services that ran online circles with children and families where the children had breached COVID guidelines. And it was just reportedly relatively straightforward for them to organize a bunch of people because no one had to go anywhere to participate. Also in terms of professionals joining a community of practice, we had, um, you know, say restorative city groups or um, perhaps, you know, geographically bounded restorative practice groups where communities of practice were much easier to organize online again, because of no commuting time. Thank you. Wonderful. Ashley, your thoughts. Thank you. So to give a little bit of framing about where I was when we pivoted, I was uh, in the midst of three sort of large projects, one with the University of California, San Diego. Uh, I piloted a program with Justine Darling and the National Conflict Resolution Center to train students to be circle facilitators for their peers. Now, this program had been going on for three and a half, four years or so, and we were getting eight to 12 students showing up at these circles. And they were really involved and it was really effective. What happened when we went online is 60 students showed up, 75 students showed up. Many of them showed up with their cameras off. And at first that was a little challenging to, to make that shift, but when we provided that space and made it okay, we had so much more participation. 
We had participation verbally in chat, lots of emojis. So it was really, really clear that we were filling a need that existed, but the students for whatever reason weren't able to physically make it. So bringing that online was a significant advantage for that particular program. I was also working with the National Conflict Resolution Center on community building circles for residents, specifically interfaith and interpolitical um, bridging divide circles. And again, the participation in these circles just grew and grew and grew. The number of circles that we were able to offer grew and grew and grew. Uh, so we saw a lot more participation there. And then at USD, we were just about, the center was brand new. <laughs> so we were just about to launch into a whole bunch of in-person three-day trainings and immediately had to pivot one thing that I really discovered um, as an advantage during the pivoting and that training is when you're in a three-day training, you are steeped in the work for three days. You're fully in it. You're, you're having conversations about it for three days. When we went online, it's not feasible to spend three days on Zoom. Well, it's not fun, right? No. So we spread out these training sessions over a six-week period and added in this really robust component of asynchronous work. So the advantage there was having folks steeped in the work for six weeks and building this community of practice within their cohort that clearly became more sustainable because we're hearing from folks from those first trainings who are still in a community of practice together. Um, one advantage that I really saw is being in each other's homes. I really loved that. Even when we had a blurred background, um, I set up my, my home office to be my centerpiece essentially. Um, which is why I have these little pieces here. Um, but being in one another's homes just created more intimacy and created a space for more grace. When babies are crying, we understand what's pulling on someone, right? When a puppy jumps in a lap, we understand what's happening. When there's um, jackhammering going on outside someone's home. So that increased sense of grace and understanding and humanity being able to see each other in our full humanity, I think was a significant advantage. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, we talked a little bit about the audiences, the people that we were able to reach that were successful, um, perhaps even preferential with this work um, because adoption for the technology across demographics was high. And the video conferencing app saw these unprecedented surges in usage. But having said that, was it even across the board? Were there audiences or applications that perhaps fell through the cracks um, or were not reached or missed opportunities? And um, again, I'll start with you, Ian. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Julie. I suppose the obvious one is around access to technology. Mm -hmm. And I, it's difficult to say, but I'd almost say, you know, certainly within the university and within the other work that I do, um, access to good quality web connection was probably more of a problem than access to devices. So people, um, you know, could join on their phones. More people had smartphones, I suppose, which had uh, joining capacity than actually had strong and stable internet connections that would permit video conferencing. So that's, and also, of course, people can't use their offices or any sort of public or shared space. Libraries are closed, the universities closed, and so on. So that's kind of one thing. And obviously, that applies to both restorative justice and restorative practices. Um, and this is one, again, I suppose it applies to both, although I have a restorative justice example in mind. Also, there are people who lack a quiet or a private place to be at home. Um, you know, I think some people probably, not necessarily rationally, if that's the right word, but actually get would be more nervous about people seeing into their house. Um, other people, I mean, I'm thinking of one case the jurisdiction I won't mention, but where a restorative justice uh, service provider was delivering a conference and they were, they knew that someone was watching off screen. So one of the parties, in this case, the perpetrator had a family member with them who was uh, seeking not to, uh, 
not, not to be known that they were effectively there in the conference. So that was quite difficult um, for them to deal with. And I suppose um, the other one that came up in the research was about people who could benefit from or really need immediate follow-up. So if someone, um, it, you know, becomes very emotional, you know, it taken a restorative justice conference, if someone needs to leave the room for a second, the practitioner can go with them, right? Mm -hmm. Or say that someone is not visibly emotional, but a practitioner observes that there is a problem, once you know you catch them afterwards and that's just a little bit certainly more difficult or, or different when you know you hang up and maybe you call them on the phone and maybe they pick up or maybe not and where practitioners identified that as an issue was um firstly there was more reliance on co-located people to flag when there was an issue so you know there were places where um i think this was in norway they were trying to operate um online or sort of virtual mediation but where each of the parties did have a practitioner physically with them uh that was because they decided that they needed to have someone there but also they have quite good capacity you know they have the resources to be able to do that other services and jurisdictions did not the other thing that practitioners brought up in this um I, again it, was, it wasn't really research that i did it was workshops meredith did some research and it was that the online environment could even generate a false sense of psychological security so people might open up too quickly um and then they wouldn't have that access to follow-up support and that's at the, you know, the high end of restorative justice, I suppose, at the at the low end, you know, say that I'm delivering circles with students. Um, sometimes you notice that someone's not entirely comfortable and you might catch them at the end to say, like, well done or, you know, great participation today or, you know, I, I, I really hope to see you at the next one. And it's just that little bit of confidence that you can instill in those informal interactions. And I mean, if you think about restorative justice conferences, like a lot of practitioners say that you do the conference and then there's tea and coffee over there. And that's where proper reconciliation happens because they're like, oh yeah, okay, but seriously, sorry though. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. And so you just lose all of the, all of that um, informal opportunity for, I suppose, that relational work. Hmm. Wonderful points. Ashley. Yeah, the privacy issue definitely has been a concern because you don't know how free anyone is to speak their mind and, and speak their truth. Um, the chat function is really, really helpful for that, thankfully. Uh, I saw older participants, especially with the resident circles that I was doing, older participants who just had not had the opportunity to be tech savvy because their world didn't include all of this. Uh, struggled a little bit and then also folks who didn't have access to um, technology on a daily basis and didn't know how to navigate it so really early on i saw folks who jumped in right away got it they were really quick other folks who were a little bit behind so we had to um, create the opportunity to bring everyone up to capacity to be able to engage in an equal way and mitigate using those tools that would disenfranchise folks or make them feel confused or, or left out. Uh, caretaking definitely was an issue. And with caretaking, I found um, definitely having someone, you know, a therapist or a psychologist or another practitioner in a breakout room that folks could self-select if they needed to was really, really helpful. Also, we couldn't control if somebody just hung up and left, right? So that was a challenge for us. Um, students, also younger students um, who are really, really comfortable with the technology, have no problem with the technology, but do have a problem with video. That was a challenge. <laughs> so video and, and even audio. Uh, so I would facilitate circles for a, you know, a group of 30 students, no cameras, no audio, almost entirely chat because they just weren't comfortable showing up that way. Uh, so, so really being adaptable <laughs> was key. Ashley, a little more about your last point. Do you think that that had to do with the fact that they were so accustomed to texting and, and, and that was very much their world? 
or can you think, were there any other reasons why they might want to all turn their video off? For many students, um, to Ian's earlier point, they didn't want to show their homes or their rooms. Um, I heard, you know, anecdotally from, from young people that they just weren't comfortable showing um, their rooms on or their homes on camera. Um, many young people shared with me that they felt uncomfortable showing their face, watching themselves in video. Uh, I happen to have two teenagers in my own home. <laughs> they are about to turn 20 and 18. And both of them participate in their classes with camera off and, and audio off. So, um, you know, it's not universal, but certainly it seems to be um, just they're more comfortable with the texting, they're more comfortable with chat, and they don't really see a need to be on camera. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so following up on cameras and videos, um, Zoom has done some research, as you would imagine, you know, during such an active time for them, and found that eye contact on Zoom is eight times higher compared to a physical conference. And people raise their volume 15% if they're on video versus in person. Um, and my colleagues in academic settings have commented that teaching remotely can, can feel intense. Well, I, they're right. There's some reasons why it feels intense. Um, but practitioners rely on specific tools in this work. For example, feeling scales, verbal cues, talking pieces, um, the selective use of silence. So when the practice pivoted, which of those tools could be modified, needed to be modified, um, and how? And how would you compare the substitute? Ian, take it away. Thanks, just to check. Ashley, you don't want to go first, do you, by any chance? I don't want to necessarily be the first voice every time. <laughs> We, we could throw it to Ashley too. <laughs> I'm happy to. I'm happy. Thank you for the invitation. That's kind. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, one of the first most obvious things that needed to be modified was the centerpiece. So I mentioned, you know, my, my background is a little bit my centerpiece. Uh, and we came up with some creative ways to create community centerpieces. So one uh, tool that I use a lot is just having people rename themselves. Choose a value or a strength that feels really important to you right now or something that you're leading with in the moment mm -hmm. and change your name to be, you know, Julie Joy, Ashley mm -hmm. Hope or something like that, right? And then we're able to have a community centerpiece in this cobbled together way, but it works really, really well. Um, presencing is uh, you know a tool for practitioners is being deeply, deeply present and bringing our participants into presence. And that um, definitely was a challenge because when you're in a room full of folks and you have a centerpiece in front of you, you have a talking piece and the room is quiet and there are no distractions, mm -hmm. presencing is a little bit easier. When you're at home and you have teenagers walking through, as I just did, making breakfast, then it's a little bit more difficult. So, um, so we definitely, you know, encourage folks when they join Circle to shut down everything else, take mm -hmm. a few deep breaths. And, and I, when I'm um, facilitating a Circle, I'll pause several times throughout the Circle just to help bring people present. Um, to your point, Julie, about the, uh, about the eye contact, Mm -hmm. um, there is this disembodying sense when you're staring at a screen for a really long time and when you have folks, when you have eyes looking back at you, all of these oh, sets yeah. of eyes, right? There's this disembodied sense. So one of the tools that um, I use pretty frequently is to pause um, in a circle, in, in a workshop and just say, let's have everybody look around the room and just feel more in your body, stand up, just kind of shake things out a little bit and recenter. And that seems to really help the Zoom fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, another thing that, that I noticed with uh, the online space is we fill the silence. So having silence in an online space is a little bit more challenging. So making sure that we take the time and we make the invitation to just be silent and be okay with that really, really helps uh, in this space as well. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Ian. Thanks for the invitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Just thinking there also about, um, you know, the students with their cameras off. I mean, <clears throat> a lot of them are like 
on their bed or in the kitchen with family like they um they're not in a place where they could really or where they would want to have their camera on um so just just to mention that i mean you know here um here even in normal times most students do live at home because I suppose small country commuting distance and so on and housing is very expensive. So I mean, you know, they're all this could be like six people or more in the house together and um, sharing a small number of potential workspaces. Yeah, in terms of um, adopting the tools for online, I suppose, in the work that we did on restorative justice. There was a big difference between restorative justice services that were used to being organized and those which just maybe didn't have those skills because some pivoted you know in a very organized way very quickly and others to this day um services i i've worked with that you know still really struggle and don't really have the tech down in order to have a hybrid a kind of you know of a restorative event so whereas other ones, and I mean, I will, I will name one that was very good in particular because we name them in the paper, Longmont Community Justice Partnership. I don't know if you've come across those guys in um, Colorado, but, you know, they created a whole bunch of materials that were digitized. They had, and I had just a list here, a technological preamble, which said like, you know, remember to bring water, remember to bring tissues, all that stuff that you'd organize for people. They had to digitize their um, outcome agreements, their consent forms. They had to have protocols that explained, you know, what does happen if someone's web goes down or they're on mute or whatever. And also because they're very reliant on volunteer facilitators, we know from the criminal justice research on the use of volunteers in criminal justice interventions that that tends to be older people. And so, you know, they had um, uh, some work to do around training groups of practitioners who were less likely to be digital natives, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, and then in terms of the very practical skills, um, you know, we found that people people spoke about using verbal cues instead where they would have previously used eye contact or body language, for example, to indicate turn taking. And actually, and this is interesting, you know, why we did this work with Meredith as well, because she had a lot of this, a lot of similar things from hybrid and virtual courts research, where judges have to play a kind of more of a facilitator role to do things like indicate whose turn it is to speak, introductions, things that actually are kind of normal restorative justice things and not particularly normal court things. Um, then in terms of, yeah, use of silence. So obviously in restorative justice, you'd use silence to indicate respect and reflection and encourage participation. But, you know, we heard that the video environment does present a bit of a challenge for that because you might conclude that an internet connection has been lost if someone goes silent. Like, like, and it, it links to what you said, Ashley, for silence to be an effective tool, everyone has to realize it's on purpose, I suppose is the point. And so facilitators, I think, um, or many of the facilitators that spoke to us anyway, did talk about needing more verbal cues and kind of the implication is it's more directive it's more directive facilitation style whereas really as a facilitator you want to sit in the room and probably not say as anything or as little as possible but i think online we heard a lot that you know that was more challenging you have to be more directive in your approach mm -hmm. ian one question has surfaced um and uh request that you repeat the name of the organization in colorado yeah, no problem. It is the Longmont Community Justice Partnership, L-O-N-G-M-O-N-T, Longmont. I want to mention something really quick, Julie, about the about the um, the facilitation of the of the sharing, the talking piece, the verbal talking piece. Mm -hmm. I really found that to be a challenge because I don't want to I don't want to um, direct right exactly to your point, Ian. I want to be a participant. I want to gently guide but not direct the action so that I feel like I'm over facilitating. And we've used a lot of tools just for, for those who are here, we've used a lot of tools such as type your name into chat. 
that's the share order, right? Mm -hmm. And um, making sure that we have the understanding and the agreements that when we pass the talking piece, sometimes in circles, we literally, I have my AirPod case, but we'll pass the talking piece. Um, and making sure that you give those verbal cues, like I would like to pass the talking piece to Julie. And Julie mm -hmm. says, thank you and receives it. So really mimicking as much as possible the in-person experience online is both fun and also effective. Um, also just a little Zoom note, you can put people in order on your screen if you're the host and then share that order with everyone else. So that's really helpful too because you actually have a, a laid out share order. I always found that really difficult, if I may say, because it, all, the, the order changes on the screen when people turn their cameras on and off. Yes. If, uh, now, maybe there's a, an admin way of dealing with that, but I never found yeah. it. And then the other thing was, because I remember actually, it's, it, I remember that a colleague of mine did attend your power of play thing, because oh. didn't you do pass the light? Yes. And you can kind of see where the arms are going. But mm -hmm. I've ended up, and I'm not sure this is the right thing, I end up saying the names, right? So I say, Julie, and then Julie stops. And then I say, Ashley, Xander, mm -hmm. and I do go around like that, which is more directive. But I find that every time I do, and maybe people just need to get used to it, like you, you, you say who is next, mm -hmm. people just forget. And it takes so long <laughs> for people to do it. <laughs> Yeah. And that's where silence comes into play because I just, <laughs> well, and they'll figure it out. <laughs> well, Ashley, following up on that, you and I had a conversation and we were talking specifically about talking pieces. And I was on one call, one circle very early on of, in the pandemic when we were all very awkward and the talking pieces really kind of became um, a distraction. They were, someone had sort of over thought it they got a little a, they got it to be a little precious and as far as what they meant and you talked about um, when you realized that this pivot was going to be more than a few weeks um, how did you pull out to honor the important parts of circle facilitation for this adaptation could you follow up on that just a wee bit Sure. Well, uh, the first thing I did was I just made an assumption that I was a babe in a new world and I needed to relearn everything through this new lens. Mm -hmm. So I literally went back to the 12 pages or whatnot of notes I took by hand for my first RJ training forever ago <laughs> and reread all of those notes, reread all of my basic primer information through the lens of we live in an online world now and what does this look like so so for me going back to the basics was incredibly helpful incredibly um, uh, important to help me feel settled in this new space in the work and to in order to honor those elements one of the first ways that I facilitated a circle was actually to create a graphic and share my screen. So I asked all circle participants to send me a photo and just created a graphic of everyone's face in a circle. And then there are all kinds of little fun things that you can do with your computer, right? So I turned my cursor into a heart. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just passed the cursor as different folks were talking. Now, I really liked that and it was, it was nice. Um, it was a very early adaptation what we all learned in the midst of doing those that series of circles is we really wanted to see one another and not have the share screen taking up the whole space so that was a good learning um but yeah i just went back to the basics and i looked at my rj 101 through the lens of we are not in person so what does this look like yeah exactly Okay, um, it appears that hybrid work is here to stay. And again, some research from the folks at Zoom, they found that very few respondents think that their activities will be virtual only forever. Um, but they welcome how a hybrid environment allows you to work and have that fit around your life. Um, so that begs the question going forward, we're certainly seeing great improvement in the cases, the wastewater numbers, all of the metrics in Minnesota continue to look, look very favorable, um, which is heartening, but what practices should, could, should or could be virtual ongoing basis and, and which ones would really be best served in person? 
Who'd, who'd like to jump on that one? Ian. I think he's he's opening the door for me. That was that was yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I actually really love training online. Uh, I love training in person. It, mm -hmm. And and when I'm talking to um, to institution clients right now, and they're asking me which do you prefer, the only thing I can do is just weigh the pros and cons. So as I mentioned earlier, being steeped in the work over a six week period and building that community of practice and having this robust asynchronous work and having an online forum to communicate, that's great, right? Um, and the three-day in-person where you can really be fully, fully immersed is, is an incredible experience. They're different. Mm -hmm. uh, I love about the training experience that it provides access to anyone with a computer or a phone. And that is huge. And we've seen the impact of that um, the reduced cost makes it more accessible. Um, just the fact that folks can join from home, all of the obvious. Um, where I find I really don't want to be online is definitely in circles responding to harm, where emotions are high and caretaking, higher level of caretaking is needed. I really, really prefer those to be in person. However, the one advantage that I really liked being online in uh, restorative response to harm is the communication between facilitators and the communication between uh, perhaps people who have been harmed or people responsible for harm and the facilitators. Um, we don't want to encourage too much of that because we want transparency. And at the same time, there's an increased level of safety that comes with that ability to communicate. Now I'll pass it over to you. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I mean, I suppose um, three points I'd make. One is that I would probably not do anything online that I could do in person. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that I'm now very used to doing that is not possible to do in person. And that ranges from everything to, um, you know, stuff like this, for mm -hmm. example, um, and even at the domestic level, like we organized a workshop the other day that had 160 people from all from Ireland. We, you know, people from place, you know, and it started at 930, you know, people from more than an hour away wouldn't have been able to come to that. Right. So it really does enable um, broader audiences to attend things. So that's something I will definitely continue doing online. Um, in terms of restorative justice, it's really interesting, right? And there's kind of two schools of thought. And I'm not sure where I fall. And broadly speaking, there is a school of thought which says that face-to-face -face is so much better than anything else that you should effectively prioritize that. And only if people really don't want to do it like that should you offer other options. Whereas the other school of thought would say, give people all of the options and permit them to decide what they want, even if they um, might wrongly, you know, um, fall back on an easier one that is not as beneficial. So you know, it's difficult in restorative justice because we do know that face-to-face -face is more effective than indirect communication, although indirect communication can be extremely beneficial. We also know that if you offer people indirect communication, lots and lots of people will opt for that. And therefore, I've heard some people argue that, you know, we shouldn't really always give all the options as though they are equally good, because people will kind of nervously not pick the best one. But of course, that's kind of contradictory because also restorative is about empowerment. It's about individual assessment. Like who are we to say that, the, well, you know, you're picking the wrong one out of nervousness or so on. So I suppose in restorative justice, it is about individual assessment. Um, you know, maybe a practitioner could still explore the reasons why someone would opt for indirect to see if the person on reflection actually might prefer face-to-face, -face, even if they didn't realize that at first. Um, but there are people that are worried that everyone is just going to choose to go online if that's offered as an option all the time, I suppose, is where, where I'm coming from with that. 
You know, I just want to toss in there really quickly that uh, one of the biggest informers for me when we first pivoted uh, were my two teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I had a long talk with them about building relationship online. And uh, my son is a video game designer. My daughter is a digital artist. So they live their lives online. They have incredible communities online. And I just asked them, you know, how close do you feel with these people? that some of them they've been friends with for three, four years and they've never seen their face, if you can even imagine, right? Mm. And they really informed me that not only is their human connection deep and well-founded and well-formed and um, connected and trusting, but that in some cases they feel so much more connected to somebody that they can share such deep truth with over, Oh, you know, online versus face to face where somebody with anxiety or somebody who struggles with something else might have a difficult time doing. So that was um, sort of the, the first thing that made me lean very heavily into believing that this format could really work for us <laughs> was hearing my teenagers talk about the incredible relationships that they formed online. Well, and following up on Ian's comments, um, some, something of a COVID silver lining for me was the fact that I was able to start a program at Eastern Mennonite University where they've done such great work in restorative justice. But in the past, that would have required me getting to Harrisonburg, Virginia. And the fact that that was offered online um, was very helpful. And even, I mean, our conversation today, um, to have you in here from Ireland, I'm in Minnesota and, and um, Ashley is in California. So this allows us to take a broad look at the topic and no one had to get a, on a, in a car on an airplane. Um, I think we've got some wonderful questions. So I think we'll move to the questions now. And um, again, Ashley and Ian, feel free if you wanna bounce any questions off each other to go for it. Um, the first one is, can you provide examples of how restorative justice has been used to incorporate cross-border victims into a foreign justice system? Now, that, that's outside the realm of any of the work I've done. Any thoughts on, on, that, on that very specific question? Yeah, there were a few cases that came up um, where jurisdictions with public restorative justice services that already had contacts were collaborating on usually, the, usually the case was outside of the criminal justice process. That was a thing. So even in the public ones, and, or even I should say in the, in the non-state ones. So, I mean, you know, you have, for example, restorative justice services, their third sector or individual practitioners who offer restorative justice in cases of intrafamilial violence, where maybe the victim self refers, but no one's ever been prosecuted. There's never going to be a prosecution, so on. Um, so the cases of, and in that case, I, I remember being informed of a few where, you know, the offense was a long time ago and one of the parties lived in another country. And so, you know, it was like, a, but it was, and it was intrafamilial um, sexual abuse in nature. So in that case, you know, the practitioner could say to the person in the other country from them and the, and the participant who was in their country, we could do this online if you wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and I, I, can't, I can't think of examples. I think actually there were ongoing cases, the details of which were not divulged at the time. But I remember that, um, and I think it was actually Estonia and Finland, I could be wrong about that, that all, where the restorative justice services already had contacts and where, you know, it, it, there, was, there would be a reason that someone might have been in one country previously and was in the other country currently. So those are the kind of things. I think what the, the person might be asking, and maybe I'm wrong, it probably is a bit difficult where the um, case is referred by the criminal justice process and therefore the possible conclusion of the case or diversion of the case is contingent on restorative justice being successful. 
um, probably that could be a little bit difficult. But I mean, it would have to be in that case that the parameters of the restorative justice were those of the country in which the service and perpetrator were based, I suspect. Our next question um, comes from our, my colleague, Father Dan Griffith. Um, there are several layers of harm from the pandemic that have been experienced globally. How can RJ practices be used to effectively help name and heal this harm? What, what I often think of when it comes to this topic is healthcare workers, because we have healthcare practitioners in our family. Um, he adds, I am thinking of the aftermath of the pandemic. Um, there will be much healing work to be done. How can RJ provide forums for this needed healing? I'll just share that, that right at the beginning, uh, because I was already working on this uh, county resident community building circle project with the National Conflict Resolution Center, we immediately started offering circles around uh, the topic of COVID. Um, we had circles on loss, uh, we had circles for healthcare providers, um, which as you can imagine was difficult for them to show up for, but they did. Uh, those circles started to expand across the country. And what I found to be um, most impactful was witnessing people experience the universality of their feelings. Mm -hmm. So knowing that it's not just my local community, my neighborhood, even my town, we all are feeling the same. We all are hurting. So, and, and so much hope too. I mean, we, we would have circles with just the depths of despair and the highest of hopes all in the same space, right? So for me, that was the most impactful use of the practice um, for the first year and a half after our quarantine here in California in March. Uh, and, I, and I would love to see that continue so that we can all be in conversation about what healing looks like for all of us and make the world feel a little bit more connected. Yeah, it's interesting because scaling that up would be resource intensive, not relative to the amount of resources that humanity invests in doing things that are incredibly damaging, but relative to the fact that currently, you know, there have been very few, if any, resources invested in enabling that kind of dialogue. So, I mean, we heard um, similar things in Barcelona and here and also in Lecco in Italy and some of the work from Lecco, you can find information about it on the website of the European Forum for Restorative Justice, where you know, I suppose similar local restorative groups and practitioners brought together groups of people who'd lost people or groups of medical professionals or professionals or other communities or other types of professionals or other groups of people that there was some sort of community, like a group of students, for example. Um, and, you know, ask them how they were doing, people tell stories. And, you know, for me, I mean, I really like the LECO work because and there's a great article, again, on the European Forum website by a woman called Claudia Mazzucato, who talked about, in particular, that where they were in northern Italy um, and in other countries, too, there are like big movements of, you know, families of COVID victims where they're trying to prosecute hospital administrators and government officials and falling into all the same trap of thinking that adversarial and punitive is going to bring healing. And we just know that that's, you know, really not particularly likely. Um, so what they did in LECO, which was really interesting, was not just that it was sharing that permitted the universality to be realized, but they had mixed groups of medical professionals and victims, uh, you know, or, or family members of people who died of COVID, where the family member says, you know, why, why didn't you do anything or, you know, just out of how they feel. And the medical professional said, well, let me tell you what we do do and what it's like for us. And everyone immediately forgives each other. And there's no conflict there, really. Um, so, I mean, that sounded amazing. Uh, and I would really recommend there was also a, a webinar, which I think the European Forum have published with the LECO people speaking. 
then I would uh, also point to, you know, there have been decades of research on transitional justice processes in post-conflict settings, which is relevant because the question is, you know, how do you do this kind of work at scale? Victim participation or dialogue or healing, if you, you know, some combination thereof. Um, and that work shows that it is very difficult. It's very difficult for that work to gain, gain traction and to gain legitimacy and to be sustained at the scale needed. Um, so other work I would point to that I think is really interesting is some of the more recent work around what might be broadly referred to as restorative inquiries and some work that Victoria University of Wellington did in New Zealand around surgical mesh where, and I, I don't know this, the, the science of it, but effectively, a type of surgical, um, a piece of, of material that's implanted as part of surgery for, for medical reasons, but then, you know, it's, it's under certain circumstances, it has now been totally accepted that it causes lots of pain and it, you know, it shouldn't have been done in the way that it was done. And people are very concerned about it because, you know, there, there are victims of it, right? Um, and with funding from the New Zealand Department of Health, and this is where the resources come in, they did do circles with hundreds of victims of surgical mesh, you know, family members, representatives of the medical industry and insurance industries and policymakers, um, which had the multiple outcomes of universality, wrecking, you know, people had never met each other. Oh, you know, and, and so much of it, you know, people had been told like maybe, you're, it's all in your mind. So you to be in a room of people explaining that no, we're all the same, you know, is really. But then also the other the other side, you know, heard from the victims, and also they got to um, co-create what the outcomes are going to be. And I think that is the big potential, you know. Well, aside from the healing, I suppose, and the education that comes through dialogue, the big potential around mass participation is that people can be involved in identifying the needs and co-creating the outcomes going forward. The Canadian truth and reconciliation process, you know, if you look at, um, and that was a non-state process, um, but I mean, they came up with like 600 outcomes and that's because these things are complicated and there's a million things you have to do, but only by me, you know, having the people with a stake in those outcomes being involved in deciding what they are, will you ensure that it's as likely as possible to meet those needs? The other restorative inquiry, just to note, um, was, you know, Jennifer Llewellyn was involved in this around, um, uh, some of their work in Canada, she, she's a prophet, Dalhousie University as well. So there, there are some examples, I think, of where, I suppose in Jennifer's work, it was really about, you know, hers is all about it's relational, it's values-based, and then what do you do to respond to harm based on those values? The New Zealand work, I suppose, was similar, but it was also more like circles are a useful way of getting people involved. How can we do as many circles as possible in such a way to, that people can hear from each other? So I think there is there is increasingly examples of how that work can be done well, but it's resource intensive and needs to be funded. Okay. There are two questions that I'll um, close with, and then um, just a a quick update on our next event. The first one I would say is really more of a comment, but I do wanna share it. And the second one um, goes to the, the request that I made of Ashley and Ian to send me any resources, websites, any follow-up information that you think might be helpful. Here's the first one. I am in support of what Ian is saying in regards to restorative justice and peace circles being better in person. Relationship and healing seems to me to be much more authentic. From what you are saying, hiding behind the screens will be a tragedy for our society today and long into the future. Um, perhaps that's that's more of a comment that are, than a question, but if either of you like would like to follow up. I, you know, uh, from my, before the webinar started, I shared that I have a theater background way, way, way back, right? Mm -hmm. And so that comment makes me think about yes and, the principle of yes and. Mm -hmm. So, you know, rather than thinking of, of human connection, um, it can only happen in this space or that space, right? We want to use one to maybe fuel the other. 
so folks can connect with one another across the globe online and then work their way toward being together in the same space. Um, in the case of my children, um, not to expose my daughter, but she struggles with anxiety. And so for her, that pathway really works for her to be able to connect first online where it's less threatening and less scary, and then to work your way toward in-person. And I actually agree um, with Anne-Marie. I think that we do want to be face-to-face. -face. We really, really want to connect. And I also see a place, a healthy place for online connection too. Um, the last comment, and this is a beautiful segue. If someone was interested in studying restorative justice mechanisms, are there any websites, books, or trainings you would recommend for a novice? And this, you know, I think is, is a beautiful um, ask for both of you to share, share with me. I will share with the registrants um, a few of, a links to a few of the places that you think for someone beginning in this practice would be helpful resources and, and help them to, to kind of learn more and begin their work. Um, the recorded video of this webinar will be on our in initiatives webpage in the next few days. And we will also send out a follow-up to everyone with those resources and that link. Um, please join us for our final program of the academic year, Tuesday, May 17th. It will be titled Justice and Healing for a Wounded Community. And Minneapolis, as, as, everyone, as people have heard around the globe, has certainly had much harm in the past two years. A conversation with civic and religious leaders in this forum, Father Griffith will moderate panelists and explore the roots of that harm in the Twin Cities and Minnesota, what is needed to build a pathway to greater justice and healing for our community. The Basilica of St. Mary in Minneapolis will co-sponsor and they will host this event. So with that, we are wrapping up right on time. A great big thank you to both our panelists, Ashley and Ian. Um, I, I see perhaps a year from now, um, an opportunity for all of us to regroup and see if the situations that we talked about today or that we imagined um, might happen, um, have indeed happened and in what the world looks like um, in 2023. Thanks to everyone for joining us, much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you.